Welcome. Welcome to the Poetry Flash reading series. I'm Joyce Jenkins, Poetry Flash editor and director, beaming to you from Poetry Flash in Berkeley. Today we are pleased to present a reading to celebrate the new anthology, Fog and Light. This reading is co-sponsored by Moe's Books in Berkeley. You can purchase the featured book online at our online bookshop for these readings, bookshop.org slash lists, L-I-S-T-S slash poetry hyphen flash hyphen readings. And you'll find this link in the chat box too. You are muted on entry. Please don't unmute yourselves during the reading so that we can hear from our amazing poets. To share your thoughts during the reading, please use the chat box. This meeting is being recorded and will be on the Poetry Flash Facebook page and YouTube channel. At the end, after the recording has stopped, we'll keep the Zoom on for a few minutes so those who are joining us live can ask a question of our poets or say hello. Please visit poetryflash.org to see our, home, our, our homage to Michael McClure news about the upcoming Northern California Book Awards, and much more. To sign up for our mailing list on email, go to poetryflash.org and scroll to join our mailing list. Here's Richard Silberg, Poetry Flash Associate Editor, to introduce our poets. Hi, hi everybody. We're gonna we're gonna hear from a a really uh, a really exciting anthology tonight, fog and light, San Francisco through the eyes of poets who live here, and live here actually means spend a significant amount of their time in San Francisco, whether they live here now or not. Uh, in addition to the poets who are reading tonight, there's some, there's some really, uh, some of the more interesting, notable poets of San Francisco are in the anthology, including the late, great Lawrence Ferlinghetti and two other uh, poet laureates, uh, Jack Hirschman and Alejandro Murguia. Now the shaper, the shaper of this, the maker and shaper of this anthology is Diane Frank, who selected the poems and, and published the uh, book. And we wanna thank her right off the bat. Thank you, Diane. And our first reader will be Vince Gotera. And his, uh, his recent book is The Coolest Month which is riffing off uh, T.S. Eliot. <laughs> and it actually is, a, is a, a book of poems written one every day in April. He grew up in Haight-Ashbury as a, a musician, a lead guitarist. And so let's give him a warm welcome, Vince Gotera. Thank you, Richard. And thank you also to Diane uh, for uh, creating this book and, and more particularly for choosing my poems. And thank you also to Joyce and to Poetry Flash. Um, I want to start off tonight with uh, a poem uh, by someone else, by Lucille Lang Day. Richard mentioned um, that I grew up in, in the Haight-Ashbury and, that's, and I, I went to St. Agnes School, which is on Ashbury. Uh, those of you who are from San Francisco or who are familiar with San Francisco will know that now as the Lycée Frances. Um, and the school was directly across the street from the Grateful Dead House. Um, so Lucille Lang Day, 710 Ashbury, 1967 for Jean Anthony. The photographer hangs out on Haight Street entranced by youths and beads and braless girls in lace and feathers who weave flowers in their hair. 
He smokes weed with his subjects and wraps his foot to the beat of Jimmy, Janice, and the Jefferson airplane. He has told his agent not to call him. No more dogs, flags, wine labels, politicians, or corporate portraits. In his office in New York, the agent paces. He's apoplectic. So many clients waiting. His guy in San Francisco is a flake. Hugging, I'm sorry, excuse me, lugging his camera bag up Ashbury, where nothing is more important than Jerry Garcia and his uncle Sam Hap, and Phil Lesh with a golf club. The photographer rings the bell at 710, tells the dead where to stand, and the world snaps into place. All right. Those of you who know that uh, th th those pictures on, the, on that first album will remember, uh, uh, I think that there was a picture that was taken of, of the whole band sitting on the steps of, of that house. All right. Um, Okay, so this is the cover of my book that, uh, in which the first poem uh, I'm gonna read from Fog and Light appears. And, and I put in the chat how, how you can get one if you'd like. This is called Doggy Diner, Gary and Arguello, 1969. If we were all in the same room, I would ask you to raise your hands if you, remember, if you know what a doggy diner is. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> all right. Doggy Diner, Gary and Arguello, 1969. Out of San Francisco night, the cool fog's gray fingers caressing hills and houses emerged in chef's hat and bow tie, the dog, a seven foot dachshund's head in fiberglass. Tina, my first real high school girlfriend, and I entered through the shiny glass doors, holding hands, both in hippie leathers, suede vests and floppy hats, bell-bottom cords. It smelled like hog heaven, grease-laden air, scents of amber gold fries and sizzling thick burgers, the sharp tang of coleslaw vinegar. We ordered dogs slathered in chili with pickles and mustard. The world was copacetic. Above the diner, the dogs slowly turned, glowing like love. And hog heaven is a hidden, uh, is a hidden reference also. I, th those of you who have been in San Francisco for a while may remember a restaurant on Stanion um, Stanion and Waller, I think, that, that was called Hog Heaven. That's really stuck in my mind because I went on a date one, one time with this woman and I took her to Hog Heaven and after we got inside, she said, I'm Jewish. And uh, it was an, an embarrassing moment. <laughs> oh, I also wanted to thank uh, the four poems I'm reading from uh, of mine that are in Fog and Light uh, all appeared uh, in, coincidentally in uh, Silver Birch Press. I want to thank the editor, Melanie, for, uh, for also uh, uh, publishing these poems where Diane could find them. <laughs> so, all right. This one's called The Front Door. The front door was a surfboard speeding forward through the 60s, except when it slammed, stopping time like granite. If not for the glass plate, if not for the glass pane in the door, which let in San Francisco's lights, the fog like gray cotton, screeching brakes, my friend Hart's house across Parnassus Street. But the door didn't stop time. Mom came in and said, Hart is dead, Vin, sorry to tell you. The night before, running from a, the police, Hart had driven off a cliff at Land's End, a joyride with a friend. Holy fuck, I could have stopped it when I was on the end Judah streetcar a month before and saw Hart with a coat hanger breaking into a VW. I could have got off, said, what are you up to Hart? Come on, give it a break, buddy. Let's go get a coat. But the moment was past. The end Judah kept on, the steel wheels scurling on the tracks, twisting time into ribbons. I imagined Hart would stop stealing cars, throw down the screwdriver. But that time I didn't get off the streetcar and confront my friend. It was always time. Sometime I'll do it. I'll say to Hart, just stop, will you? But that future day was stillborn. The taste of silver on the eyes, nine volt batteries on the tongue, fingertips on the hot iron smelling like burnt toast. That logic was no damn logic, nada. 
the KFRC record on my dresser, that album I had borrowed from Hart last year said, what you gonna do now, chicken heart? I pictured myself at that cliff where Hart died, spinning that borrowed record into the sunset air where it would sail forever, surfing to heaven and the future years Hart would never have. But I didn't do that. I didn't get off that streetcar. Moment passed, surfboard crashed, front door closed. I haven't lived in San Francisco for since about the middle of the 80s. And so a lot of these poems are from childhood. And in fact, this next poem is called Childhood. It's a high boon. So there's a, uh, a paragraph, a prose paragraph first and then a haiku. Childhood. The famed seven hills of San Francisco are actually myriad hills and steep slopes everywhere in the seven mile by seven mile square of the city. Sidewalks that are stairways, trees and houses clinging to ground, seemingly at 45 degrees, climbing upward to starry skies. Small ethnic neighborhoods sprinkled around, Russian, Italian, Chinatown, the black community of Fillmore Street, the Hispanic Mission District, Gay Castro. In the Haight-Ashbury, the, div the, the diverse integrated neighborhood where I grew up before the hippies came. Downtown in the financial district, when I was a teenager, they built a new peak, the Transamerica Pyramid, tallest building in the city, vaulting up to the sky like the Seven Hills. A new eighth wonder to rival the world famous towers of the Golden Gate Bridge. What a marvel, what a miracle the city was in my childhood. Don't call it Frisco. Native born San Franciscans just say the city. Living now thousands of miles away in snow country, I miss my hometown. Such deep richness and largeness of culture and utter beauty, San Francisco. In the haiku, steep hills, the city, pyramid skyscraper glows in my child mind's eye. Well, it occurs, it occurs, thank you. <laughs> Those who are clapping, thank you so much. Um, um, yeah, I, I, reading that now, I think this is the first time I've read it aloud to an audience. I should have said Irish also, shoot, that's a huge neighborhood, all right. Uh, and then the last poem from the book, and then I'll read you another, another San Francisco poem that's not in the book, Free Ride. As a kid in San Francisco waiting for a bus in morning fog to go to school, I would see the Six Masonic appear mag magically out of what was essentially a deep soft cloud resting on the earth. The bus would shoulder its way through thick mist like a green and yellow triceratops, the loud hiss of its air brakes, a breathy sound punctuating its slow approach. The slight ozone scent of the trolleys arcing above would counterpoint the salty taste of the cool air wafting through the city from Ocean Beach from the Pacific. Getting on the bus, I'd hold out the student Muni cardboard punch card and the driver, big beard like a black Santa, rather than punching out one of the 10 rides, would click the air above my hand and card, a free trip. He smiled huge every morning, glad to be giving a schoolboy a boost. I bet that man is wrangling a muni bus up in heaven today. I've had so, <laughs> thank you. I've had so many people tell me that, that, they, that they had that same experience as a school, you know, as a school kid uh, and, um, um, having the bus driver give him that free ride. Okay, one last poem, and this needs a little bit of explanation. Uh, this is a picture of a Philippine monster, a Mananangal, a kind of aswan. Aswan is the generic term for these monsters. And it's a woman that can split herself at the waist and the, she leaves the bottom legs uh, where they are and, and, and can fly off. She grows wings at that moment. She can fly off and prey on Strangely enough, prey on, on women and pregnant women, particularly, uh, and fetuses and, uh, and babies. And this is a, from the book that I'm working on now, which is um, a, a book about two Aswang who fall in love and try to live as, as normal humans. Um, and 
they have trouble with, you know, uh, uh, pitchforks and torches night, you know, where, where uh, the woman, Clara, uh, um, her village uh, comes to, to, uh, to kill her because they've realized that she's one of these monsters. And so there's Clara and Santiago. Santiago is a shapeshifter who can become a black dog. All right, this is called Aswang Honeymoon at the Golden Gate. Oh, I meant to tell you that they escaped then from the Philippines and moved to San Francisco. Uh, and they, uh, uh, by coincidence, happened to arrive on the day that the Golden Gate was opened and people walked across it for the first time. Uh, and, then, and then it was dedicated the following day. So that, that was on May 26, 1937. Isn't that simply magnificent, Tiago? Clara pointed above the steamship's prow as they sailed under the brand new bridge, its orange towers gleaming in the setting sun. Tiago could only nod, speechless at the beauty of the orange cable shimmering as they swooped in a graceful arc. Thousands of San Franciscans had walked across the Golden Gate that day, a grand feat never before possible. Clara and Tiago hurried but got to the bridge too late, almost dark. The next morning at the dedication, people snickered at the loony old man, the bridge watchman, who swore he'd heard leathery wings walk, walk, and saw silhouetted against the moon a bizarre flying thing holding a gigantic dog. Holding a dog, nearby listeners laugh, pantomiming, drinking from a bottle behind the poor man's back. Crazy drunk, they whispered to each other, smirking. How beautiful it must have been on top of the 800 foot tower nearest to the glistening lights of San Francisco, tiny diamonds strewn on jet black cloth. The bride's wings beating slow and soft, the groom's canine fur shining sable and sleek, holding hand and paw in the velvet night, a thousand stars showering glittery light. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Vince. I'd like to hear your lead guitar sometime. <laughs> okay, next up is Ken Haas, whose most recent book is Borrowed Light, which was a 2020 Red Mountain Press uh, Discovery Award winner. And it, it includes a lot of uh, trippy, imaginative, childhood stuff, sports and trips, but also include some of the darker uh, forces of history. His, his grandparents uh, just got out of Nazi Germany alive. So uh, there's a lot of darkness in the book too. Let's give him a warm welcome, Ken Haas. Um, thanks so much, Richard. Um, and a big thanks to Diane, uh, of course, for including me in this fabulous book and uh, to Joyce for hosting this event. Uh, I'm gonna read four poems, two poems of mine from the anthology followed by a third from the anthology, uh, but by another author. And then I'll finish with a new poem of mine. Uh, this first poem is called The Catch. Night came at candlestick toward the end of its days. June Rockwell, season ticket holder of the so-so giants has lured me out to see the wretched cubs. First date. When I pick her up, she asks if I've brought my glove and I tell her I'm from the Bronx where we do everything with our bare hands. Thin crowd, uneventful innings until two out in the seventh, when Chicago's lumbering, chaw-spitting right fielder nicks a rising heater that sails backwards several sections from our box seats into a circular gale like the twister in Wizard of Oz. The ball at its apex, still no real concern, 20 rows away. And yet, in its final moments, the object of common regard begins to beam intently, inevitably, for my patron's unarmed lap. I, 
Bud Light in one hand, fully adorned bratwurst in the other. No kidding, I refuse to panic. So the hot dog becomes at last the missing glove. Explodes like a grenade as the seamed orb makes exceptional contact. When after a decent interval, I look up, June standing now, a Jackson Pollock of ballpark cuisine, tinsels of pork rind and sauerkraut in her startled hair, glitter of mustard and relish from brow to chin, says not a word, does not go to wash up, just lowers her quivering body. The wind dies, the home team fails. We do not speak on the drive back. Ah, what might have been, but not for me. I'm romantic in that other way, this way. For this night, no if only will ever rival what happened. Watch as we reach June's flat. She turns caked still with the spectacle I have made of gallantry and kisses me softly, briefly, decisively. Watch the fog rise to claim her for the perfect past. Um, this uh, next poem is a somewhat grouchy piece called Wells Fargo. Hunched right behind me in Kafka's bank line, an octogenarian with 49ers cap askew and white stubble as old as his last floss, grunts, slowest in the Western states. So I ask him how he knows. And he snorts, don't be a smart ass. Informs me he's hiding from the social director of his assisted living center volunteers some inside scoop on the distant tellers. One only does wire transfers to South America. The other isn't yet trained to handle cash. A supervisor with the name tag Jerry is cruising the crowd, ready to apologize in English, Spanish, or Tagalog for whatever no one else is sorry about. The old dude tells him he's feeling estranged from his capital says, all I need are a couple of crisp hundreds to give his Christmas tips to my barber and my life coach. Jerry offers him a dum-dum and some hand sanitizer with aloe. I offer to get him scratch paper so he can write a poem. He mumbles, roses are black, my nose just bled and my balls itch so I'm not dead. Then he asks if we can switch places. Time is running out faster for me, he says, at which point I have to question whether any of this actually happened or if it's just a talk I'm having with myself 20 years from now in line for something else I think is mine or I wanna buy or I've already paid for. Uh, here's a piece. Um, from the Fog and Light Anthology my, by my friend, Susan Terrace. Um, one of the rich aspects of life in this city is that even though its culture is predominantly progressive, the lifestyle here is far from uniform. Uh, there are competing subcultures. For example, there's a biking culture and a hiking uh, culture or subculture, uh, which this poem illustrates. It's called Abandoned Bicycle. Behind her, a tree too young to climb, a bicycle which jolts on roads she does not wish to take. Here in the, da in the Dante dark wood, pocked with sun, she is freed from the spoke and the spoken. Here, the soft scuff of Nike, crack of twig, scumble of blackberry is everything. No chain, no blacktop or bars. Here, only a basso of bullfrog launched from a stagnant pond. Her answer, a quixotic pause, 
a nod, a greedy silence. Um, and then finally, a new poem of mine, um, not in the anthology, but about San Francisco. It's called, When the Parrots Come. Two Conyers, South Americans, bagged at birth, slipped their gilded cage here mid nineties, started a flock, hundreds now, eschewing the natives, the laurel, the live oak, whose acorns the ohlone ground to meal. They flit instead on saucer magnolia, date palms, power lines tangled over Telegraph Hill. 2020 fighting tumors, not asking on which side of her body's borders they were born or fed. Susan sees a pair of them, the parrots, testing our fire escape, a sixth floor rental miles west. They perch an hour, then zip off with a greening throng. Hoping they'll return, she puts out cashiers, which is what she has. I say there is a reason why they chose our railing. Scouts, maybe, lovers stealing a moment, the virus, the warming, Cashews could bring gulls, just leave things as they are. What drew them might draw them again. Susan from the Midwest keeps on with the cashews. Having taken in red crowns, indigo eyes, opalescent beaks. Mostly she says they sat and looked away. Sometimes though they nuzzled, danced, hung upside down where horseshoes, mooshoes, gumshoes, fish stews have leavened the soul of a city. From back east, I never see them, the parrots. We welcome the new year, everyone does. A week later, she says they came back for a spell. I say, no cashews this time, sweetheart. She says, no, no. Of course not. Thanks. Hope you like them. Oh, oh, okay, Ken. I like them for sure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up, Jody Hartle, who is a, a Sansai. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. He's a third generation. Japanese American, and she she has published a number of uh, chap books, including Heart Mountain, which is a collection of poems about the Japanese American incarceration. One of, uh, if I may add, too many of America's racist crimes. But uh, th that book won the uh, 2012 uh, Blue Light uh, Poetry Prize. So, so let's give her a warm welcome, Jody, Jody Hoddle. Thank you, Richard, and also Joyce. Really appreciate your series and the longevity of it and continuing during the pandemic. And Diane, thanks again, as everybody has expressed for putting this wonderful anthology together. Um, so I'm gonna read the three poems in the anthology in a slightly different order than they appear in the anthology. Um, the first one is titled Gaman, and Gaman means to endure hardship with patience and dignity. It's a Japanese, term. It's impossible to pack three decades of married life in two suitcases. How do I choose what to carry into uncertainty? The notice nailed to the telephone pole ordered us to bring bedding, plates and utensils, clothing, told us cameras, radios, and our dog Rusty aren't allowed. I'll wear my Sunday dress, hat, and coat over a couple of house dresses, pack my gray sweater, 
nightgown, unmentionables, find room for my Bible, our wedding portrait, and tuck in dignity, patience, gaman. So the next one I'm gonna read is titled Tanferan Assembly Center, San Bruno, 1942. And um, most of you, since you are familiar with San Francisco would know that it's near, kind of near the airport, uh, San Bruno, South San Francisco. And um, the location of this um, racetrack was kind of near where the BART station is now. And there's also a shopping center there now, but there used to be a racetrack there. Tanferan Assembly Center, San Bruno, 1942. To escape the squeeze of quarters hung with sheets for privacy, I join hundreds circling the racetrack, our scuffing feet obscuring hoof prints from racehorses that used to pace this endless oval. Ahead, my little sister Midori and her friend Fumiko bend their heads close to whisper secrets as if still strolling the halls of high school. I pass our old neighbors, Mr. and Mrs. Fujita, who shuffle slowly with newfound leisure, rekindling memories, sharing the weight of worries. I climb to the top of the grandstand, high above day-to-day -day grief. In the corner, the Shimizu brothers roll a game of dice. Mr. Morita meditates next to a man stretched out asleep on a bench. My eyes skim above the barracks and barbed wire, follow trains rumbling in the distance, planes glinting overhead to the outline of foothills that remind me of our San Francisco home, only a few miles away beyond reach. Okay, um, so this next one is um, kind of more of a general picture of the reaction to the incarceration and uh, the Japanese phrase is shikata ganai and a lot of people said that during and after their experience in the camps. Um, and I wrote this, now it's been like 20 years ago. So you'll see the math at the end doesn't quite work out, but Shikata Ganai. Shikata Ganai means it can't be helped, which translates scour and scrub till the smell of horse urine is a faint memory. Cobble a table out of scavenged fruit crate crates. Create a home from the stall that is temporary shelter for your family of six. Pretend you don't see barbed wire or soldiers with rifles and guard towers when you gaze at Heart Mountain on the horizon. Shikataganai, a tacit agreement to adopt the government jargon. Relocation and internment, not concentration or prison camp. To be as American as possible, having to prove your loyalty even though you were born here. And when your daughter hungers to know about your life in camp, you giggle about the hijinks girls and being prom queen, a typical teenage life. It suggests your secret mounting dread each year as December 7th approaches, even now over 60 years later. Shikataganai means end of discussion. I don't wanna talk about it. There's nothing more to say. And for my poet, um, whose poem I would like to read from this anthology, not mine, um, I chose to read a poem by my friend and poet, Catherine Hastings, who was the poet laureate of Sonoma County in the past. And um, Love San Francisco, but ended up moving to Grand Island, New York, which is near Buffalo, New York. And um, this poem is about her childhood in San Francisco. And I just love it because I can just picture Catherine. 
and it's titled The Bay Was My Backyard. The little steps slick with seaweed, studded with barnacles, led to the shallow rim mud floor where we rifled for starfish. So common then, common as the back and forth sardine boats and dared slow walks up the dark maw of the sewer. Who would go furthest? It all smelled, the sewer, the slime, the stars sagging our pockets, half to our knees. Honeybees droned around us as we laid on the green to dry among small wild daisies with their pink and white petals, defying all the rules of but nature's. No, I wasn't allowed off the block, but was. No, I wasn't allowed in the water, but was. No, I wasn't allowed to lie, but they weren't my rules after all. If I could have, I would have caught the first gull clouded boat slapping out under the bridge, collected salt in my hair, foghorns moaning, don't go. And then I am going to finish with um, a poem, another San Francisco poem about uh, kind of a character from San Francisco, which is Claude, the albino alligator from the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. It's a persona poem. I'm a slow mo relic though not as old as the antique railing surrounding my enclosure, its brass seahorses endlessly swimming in ornamentation. In the early morning hours, it's still, but during the day, the din is unbearable. One long scream, flashing colors from all those t-shirts, kids leaning over the rail, parents stabbing their fingers at me. Faces balloon from below, ghoulish in the glass. Mouths move, sounds bubble up. The fish and snapping turtles don't seem bothered by it at all. But they don't, but they have a bit of room to move, others of their ilk for company. Me, I'm a solo act and refuse to move. Each day I settle to stone, shut my eyes and dream of another existence. Miles of riverbank, and others to share it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Jody. All right, and our next uh, our next reader is Catherine McClung, who has published quite a, a few books of poetry. Uh, one of them, Temporary Kin, has a, a critic comment that she's a master of the uh, the the ring, the sonnet ring, and the sonnet crown, which is a ring of sonnets. And uh, of course, we don't have time for that. Maybe we can hear the sonnet or two as, uh, as she wishes. Uh, she's, she's appeared in our series before. We're really glad to have her here again. Uh, Warm welcome to Catherine McClung. Thank you very much, Richard and Joyce and Diane for putting together this amazing anthology. And thank you to my fellow readers tonight. I'm really honored to read with these fine poets. And Jody, I just loved hearing all of your poems. Thank you so much, beautiful work. Um, I'm going to start with a poem called Why We Have Windows. It's in three parts. Part one, home. Pinkest of parkas, darkest of shades. The woman pushing the cart down the sloped curb of my neighbor's driveway veils her face, preserves a privacy as she ferries bag after bag, bursting with cans, thinned perhaps by a stomp of her foot, a quick, bold act punctuating this winter day in our city, hers and mine. I can study her sneakers from here, 
Note their newness. Imagine the sound, shoe sculpting aluminum. The crack of a pistol, whip interrogating skin. No, this woman, an elder of our tribe, may bless, thank each can, change its shape, send it on its way. Two, market. Yes, it is vanity that keeps me here, unfolding frame after frame of designer eyewear, six floors up. Hey, somebody famous down there. A fellow myopic shopper, delighted, drums on the thick pane separating us from winter in the city. I gape, no squint, with her at the passing motorcade, each of us gifted with temporary spectacles, imagination, glee, x-ray vision. I bet it's the Irish president, I say. They move them around, she says. They never ride in the same car. I bet she's in that one. I point at the limo most veiled, most shaded, and we fall silent, considering the stopped traffic, the whistling of police, the ways we keep each other safe. Three, Temple. This day after the rain may be the best for walking Stowe Lake. Few others are here, a jogger, three Russian ladies bundled and scarved from the avenues, clear plastic galoshes snapped over their shoes. I may be looking for something. Yes, blue herons. Yes, turtles on thin logs. What breathes beneath the veils our tribe creates? I find comfort here, solace in hushed benches, slippery now, their small wet plaques honoring past seekers, donors. And nearing the boathouse, I glimpse one employee, a teen, unrushed, no snack bar orders to fill, no canoes to rent. She stands at a window, looking out, not at the lake. She faces another way, perhaps her future. She looks at a sprinkling of cars parked in the lot, beginning slowly to drive. As Richard mentioned, I, I do write a lot of sonnets, and I particularly love writing crowns of sonnets, which are uh, sequences of seven interconnected sonnets. I am just going to read one sonnet from a series called Renter Sonnet. Um, I've lived in the same apartment, rent-controlled apartment, in the western side of San Francisco for 30 years, and I'm very grateful for tenant activists. Um, this is Renter Sonnet number three. I say a prayer for cats dotting windows and huddling under cars, spooked by this street. The plump who snooze serene in rooms and those whose faces, sizes, names, quirks and complete health charts cram flyers tacked to poles. Rewards are promised, coaxing safe return of Spanky, Ringo, Cinnamon, Marbles, asthmatic, microchipped, and shy. Who earns these prizes? Anyone? Hope withers, wanes in each apartment on this block. The time we mourn does vary. Some may entertain their guests of grief for years. No new pets. I'm 
inclined to wait, gaze through this glass, revere the wordless, wild or tame, missing or here. Uh, the third poem I'm going to read is a poem from the book, but not by me. And it was really hard to choose one because there are so many gorgeous poems in this book. But I decided I would read one by a friend and a teacher and um, a really important person in San Francisco history, Jane Underwood, who founded several years ago the Writing Salon, which has become an amazing creative writing school here in San Francisco. Um, and I've enjoyed teaching at the Writing Salon for 10 years. Jane Underwood died of breast cancer in 2016, but her poems are still with us. Um, so I'm going to read a very brief poem by Jane Underwood called Street Cleaning Day. Jack looks like a normal guy. No one else is out on the street, just him. He moves my car from Friday to Monday, saving me from another ticket. This is something he often does, two or three times a week. I can see him in the fog, partly lit by street lamps before blue morning glories open. I watch him head out to work in his whites. That's what they call a house painter's overalls. I can see him, a beautiful phantom with my eyes closed. And I'm gonna end with one of my poems that's not in the book, um, but it is definitely a poem that's grown out of living and driving around San Francisco for 30 years. Uh, it's a pantoum which has repeating lines and um, it's meant to be an affectionate look at our city, which is very difficult to, to drive and to park in. How to drive in San Francisco. Purchase or borrow a fleck of rust add an engine, stir. You may prefer a bike with a helmet made of hemp. Camper vans are not allowed except for Airbnbs. My friend works for the Bicycle Coalition and approved this poem. You may prefer a bike with a helmet made of hemp. Your life depends on how you lock it. My friend works for the Bicycle Coalition and approved this poem. Members have more sex on average than pedestrians. Your life depends on how you lock it. Thieves carry bolt cutters and power bars from Trader Joe's. Members have more sex on average than pedestrians. Join LinkedIn groups, no more than nine. Thieves carry bolt cutters and power bars from Trader Joe's, although parking is impossible there. Join LinkedIn groups, no more than nine. Chat often with lonely people in other time zones. Although parking is impossible there, Fisherman's Wharf is more than a tourist trap. Chat often with lonely people in other time zones. They sometimes fly in and treat me to fancy crab dinners. Fisherman's Wharf is more than a tourist trap. Sailors with trombone tattoos cluster during Fleet Week. They sometimes fly in and treat me to fancy crab dinners. We pretend to haggle over the check. Sailors with trombone tattoos cluster during Fleet Week. Many visit the Ferrari showroom on Van Ness. We pretend to haggle over the check. Einstein said, <clears throat> imagination trumps knowledge. Many visit the Ferrari showroom on Van Ness. Everyone leaves changed somehow. Einstein said, imagination trumps knowledge. I'm pretty sure he rode a bike. 
Everyone leaves changed somehow. My friend from the coalition checked the archives. Delete, I'm pretty sure he rode a bike. Insert, Einstein loved bicycles. In fact, he invented them. My friend from the coalition checked the archives. Purchase or borrow a fleck of rust. Einstein loved bicycles. In fact, he invented them. Camper vans are not allowed. Thank you all very much. Okay, thank you, thank you, Catherine. Who wants to have pedestrian sex anyway? <laughs> okay, our next, uh, our next poet is Gwen O'Gara, and she's written a number of chapbooks and uh, the full length book, Snake Woman Poems, with a uh, foreword by Nanos Valoritis, who actually was teaching back when, way back when I went to San Francisco State, the famous Nanos Valoritis. Uh, Gwen O'Gara is a former uh, Sonoma County Poet Laureate. Let's give her a warm welcome, Gwen O'Gara. Thank you, Richard, uh, and Joyce. And I love the pantoum, Kathleen. It just suited the subject so well, I thought. It just writing on and on. And uh, I wanted to thank Diane again, join that chorus, and to uh, urge people, if you haven't read Blackberries in the Dream House, Diane Frank's novel, get a hold of it. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. So my first poem is Presidio. Mm. Haven of trees above the gate, windy, black winged, wet. Harbored springs clean as Shasta's. And when you followed the ravines, watercress found you too. Between beatniks and empty barracks, Julius Kahn's monkey bars dazzled. The little Jewish girl and I dizzied down the daisy studded slopes and draped our necks with pollen dusted rope. Away from ballerinas and babysitters, the dark cypress grove beckoned. Beneath black branches in dens of sand, at home in the wild and make-believe, we traded seeds and secrets. Oh, I should look at the time. Okay. My next poem is, is called Magic from Chinatown. Now, when I was an adult, uh, Chinatown, the magic for me was food and and walking from North Beach to Union Square and back along Grand Avenue and shopping along Stockton. But when I was a kid, Chinatown meant toys. And this is magic from Chinatown. Daddy's treat in a plastic bag, black gray clam, smaller than a quarter. We submerged in the kitchen sink. Hour by hour, the bivalve soaked up water, then suddenly cracked open. In another hour, a stem emerged. And over the next few hours, lengthened toward our faces. Eventually, pink and yellow petals unfurled. Every secret, stranger, lover, moon, a surprise, staggering up through watery depths toward light, prying itself open from within, blossoming. Flower face, I call you, camellia ears, rose lips. Okay. 
I'd like to read from the anthology, a poem called After the Earthquake by Robert Scottolaro. I don't remember the earthquake of 1906, but my grandparents were going to be married one or two days after April 18th. And they had to evacuate and they went by ferry to Oakland and then up to Sacramento and returned to San Francisco to raise their family, which becomes me at some point. I do remember vividly the earthquake of 57. I was a young child and my brother and I and mother were under the thresholds, the doorways into what was basically a foyer with you know steps down to the street and corridor to the bedrooms and that and that. And I remember watching this chafing dish of copper and enamel porcelain skitter along the top shelf of a book bookcase. Skitter, skitter, skitter. And all of you who have lived through earthquakes know they are not short. They go on and on and on and things undulate and roll and you don't know when they're going to stop. And that was a long earthquake. Uh, I don't think it was as long as 89, but it was long enough. Uh, and 89, our power went off too and we ate our wedding cake and you know the garage wouldn't open across the street. And, and I love this poem by Robert Scottolaro, After the Earthquake. During the blackout, we listened to news on my daughter's clown radio, tuning in disaster with a twist of a bulbous red nose. Fearful the food will rot, we empty out the fridge and take it to the lawn, which night has erased. Picnic, my daughter says giddy with play and innocence. The house of straw we exit. The big bad wolf could blow away at any moment. Back inside, our child asleep on my lap, the clown radio on hers, empty now of news and spark. My wife asks if I'm still hungry. I shake my head, but it's dark. What, she says, I'm good. I tell her, lighting another candle for the night to eat. Okay. And my last poem uh, is about a woman who lived in San Francisco before she moved to Sonoma County. Many of you may remember Penelope La Montaigne. She was a member of the Dolphin Club and she swam south, to, she swam the gate numerous times from south to north and north to south. Mm. It's called um, The Pom-Poms of St. Moritz. One of our dogs ate the piles I swept. Another loved popcorn so much, I left the lid off so fluffy kernels flew to her rummage on the floor. I don't ski. My trick knee led me off rocky slopes to sprung floors, yoga mats, and tatami. I like sparkle and quiet, the blurry edges of dream. Today, I hooked a rubber band to a necklace of chrysocolla beads, colors of the river she swam daily. So they hang over my heart and I feel my friend. I'm a better woman with her near. Penelope, her name means thread and I cross the snow glittering in the dark, laughing so hard the pom-poms on our hats explode and the strands scatter to ice and stars. We feel the dead. When someone tromps through the blizzard carrying a stretcher, 
I stop begging childhood Jesus, clasp my hands around their neck, her neck, and pin my heart to theirs. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> thank, you. Thank, thank you, Gwen. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> uh, you've reminded me of the, the, the 89 earthquake and its terrible aftermath in which the uh, giants got swept by the- Yes, air. yes, terrible, uh, terrible, uh, terrible. Uh, and the game had to stop and we got makeup tickets and we sat under balconies. Oh my God, but it was, it was, it was great to be there anyway. <laughs> okay, well, I thank you again. And uh, so our, our final reader is Diane Frank who is uh, an amazing uh, Jill of the arts, not Jack of trades, but Jill of the arts. She's got apparently eight poetry books. Gwyn told you about her, uh, her novel of which she published three. She, she is a cellist, she's a dancer, and I, 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 let me also say she's a master of uh, anthologies as well. So let's, uh, let's welcome her, Diane uh, Frank. Thank you, Richard. Um, I want to thank both you and Joyce for inviting us to read tonight. And I want to thank all of the poets who were in this book. It's so nice to do these readings because it's like the book becomes alive in the poet's voices. One of the reasons I decided to do this book is that the San Francisco that tourists visit is really not the place that the rest of us live. And, and who better to tell it from the inside than the poets? As I was gathering the poems, I was feeling like the curator of an exhibit of fine art with the art being San Francisco. And this book is our love letter to San Francisco. So my first poem is Mahler on race day. A few years ago, um, the conductor of the Golden Gate Symphony decided that we would perform Mahler's second symphony on Beta Breaker Sunday. He hadn't looked at the calendar. And for those of you who don't live in this area, the Beta Breakers is a really crazy race. Everyone's in costume. The serious runners go first, and then it's like an all-city party. And um, my husband and I live in the outer sunset, and the only way to get to the Herbst Theater was to take two cellos on the N. Judah streetcar. Mahler on race day. It begins with an epigram from Gustav Mahler. I shall soar upwards to the light which no eye has penetrated. In concert black, we carry two cellos to the N. Judah streetcar on Beta Breaker Sunday to play Mahler's second symphony. We take seats in the front of the train next to a unicorn, a dragonfly, runners in rainbow tutus, and a caveman with a leopard Santa Claus hat. Eric's tuxedo, bow tie, and hot pink cummerbund. Well, everyone's in costume. We sit across from a furry gray cat and an angel with a red, white, and blue halo. To my left, a couple holding hands and wearing the gold medals they got when they crossed the finish line. She's dressed like a bumblebee, fuzzy antennas waving from her headband. He carries a bouquet of larger than life sunflowers. More people board the streetcar, a three-eyed alien, a troll with pink hair, human-sized mice and bunnies, a leopard with a fanny pack and a six pack. A woman who flew in from Boston tells me that Beta Breakers is her 73rd birthday party. We invite her to the Mahler concert. She started piano lessons at age 66. 
no mother to tell her the piano won't fit in her house. A family of bumblebees climbs into the streetcar with black antennas and black tutus. One of them tells me the wings helped her up the Hayes Street Hill. Standing in the aisle, butterfly hats, butterfly wings, butterflies. A cello isn't out of place in this crowd. I invite a butterfly to the concert, but she prefers early music. I tell her we played Beethoven's Ninth Symphony last year. Beethoven, that's hardly early music. A bear in a fuzzy costume says that Mahler is so much better than the new music concert he heard last weekend. Sirens and pots and pans. The rainbow caterpillar agrees. Mahler has melody, cloud structure, immaculate timing, and thundering beauty. Entering the streetcar, metallic space cylinder, svelte runner in orange neon shorts, and rainbow snake earrings. Beta breakers, 7.46 miles, a marathon up and down San Francisco hills from the Bay Bridge to the Pacific Ocean. Mahler, quite a workout, 27 pages in the cello part. Allegro Maestoso at the starting gate. My teacher's advice, at the downbeat, play as fast as you can, keep running. At Van Ness Station, exit the streetcar, up the stairs, down the street, cross the race at Hayes. Traffic signals help as we weave two cellos between the tutus. A few minutes before the call, we find the side door to the Herbst Theater and a friend who plays French horn for the San Francisco Ballet. Bill says, Mahler's Second Symphony at the Herbst Theater, good for you, but is the building large enough to hold that piece? Curtain, conductor, start, it's under my fingers and I keep intense focus as I play. Waves of beauty and mystery. The soprano soloist was one of the sent down children during the cultural revolution in China. She sang to keep herself sane, then emigrated across, across the Pacific to study opera. The mezzo, a Southern belle with honey voice and tango flowers in her hair would do herself honors at the Mardi Gras. It's a hauntingly beautiful and mystical piece from the opening run to our standing ovation. After the applause, after we really did this thing in the aura of post-concert afterglow, time to take cellos back to the outer sunset. On the streetcar, we sit inside a hive of bumblebees a butterfly takes our photograph, tuxedo and concert black holding cellos. For the next week, Mahler, a fat moon, and rainbow tutus in my dreams. My next poem is about trying to watch a lunar eclipse in San Francisco. We live in the outer sunset and it was really foggy that night, three blocks from the beach. The sky away from here. Somewhere the moon turned copper. Druid circled Stonehenge in amber robes. My astronomy professor was on his balcony with a telescope. I was in San Francisco under a thick cloud cover. In the sky away from here, shadows of buffaloes ran across the moon and coyotes howled their dirge to the dark night. In London, a coven of moon clad women swept their homes, cooked moon soup, chanted the old stories, wore moonstones. In the Zagros mountains, Sufis gathered in a stone circle Red Rumi for an oracle became dervishes at midnight. In Kyoto, a geisha in Pontecho 
wore a kimono painted with a silk moon, brushed her lover with a feather. And in the Gatsby land of the Long Island beaches, two lovers bathed in the tide pool using the dark of the moon as a cover. In San Francisco, I entered my dreams as the rain pounded disappointment on my window. But in the sky away from here, luminous tattoos danced across the sky and shattered into new constellations. The buffalo, the geisha, the feather, a tide pool of lovers on the far side of the moon. <coughs> I'm going to read a tiny earthquake poem. Earthquake 5 a.m. The animals always know when an earthquake is coming. Earthquake 5 a.m. Tambler wakes me with a kiss. On the other side of the wall, a whirring of water. I open thin blinds to calla lilies, belladonna, the garden of early morning light. After the earthquake, the neighborhood dogs howl, then a silence that wraps the morning. I am also going to read a poem by Jane Underwood, Umbilical 1983. When I was a grad student at San Francisco State, Jane and I were in a writing group together, four poets who were really into each other's writing. It wasn't about ego, it was about serve, in service to the poem. That's how we described it. Uh, this is about the birth of her son. I was at her house two days later. Umbilical, 1983. I labored on the old yellow couch, a shade of mustard I'll never forget, and pushed until my face flushed red with the blood we shared. On the wall above my head, a painting by Modigliani, a woman who resembled me except for her eyes, which were closed, as if she slept, set apart from all the bliss, the mess. It was October, the sunniest room of the house, where the back door opened onto apples and belly muscles turned inside out. When your head finally crowned and you, my son, were stupendously born, umbilical cord cut, yet not, leaves churning, spinning beyond the window, life playing at the edges of spider lace curtains until it too broke through to rapture. <coughs> I just love that poem that Jane wrote and she was just so important to so many of us in San Francisco. My final poem, um, not from the anthology, it's from Canon for Bears and Ponderosa Pines. I'm going to read a poem, Magnificat, for Johann Sebastian Bach. When I was a graduate, when I was a student at Syracuse University on the maestro's birthday, we had a 20 hour marathon concert. So this poem is about my experience there. Magnificat for Johann Sebastian Bach. It was the old man's 285th birthday, and I mean the maestro, the illuminata, Johann Sebastian Bach. I was a university student, and to celebrate three centuries of musical genius, our conductor led a 20-hour marathon concert starting early in the morning. All day, musicians and students migrated in and out of the auditorium, with motets, cantatas, and concertos. A barefooted organist played the toccata and fugue in D minor, then a prelude entirely with his feet. I was amazed at the synergy of dance and sound. 
our concert master dazzled us by playing the six buck cello suite arranged for violin with his eyes closed. No music stand as he tuned to an inner singing. Segue to the entire orchestra walking on stage to play the second Brandenburg concerto, the concerto for two harpsichords, the concerto for three harpsichords, and later, just after sunset, the Magnificat. I was playing cello next to the harpsichord inside the sway of its musical body, surrounded by tones that took me back to an earlier century. That night, I had my first experience of musical transcendence. The moon was glowing through stained glass on the stage, we were playing the Magnificat. Inside, we were flying in otherworldly ecstasy. By 10 o'clock that night, I could swear the maestro was there, listening and sometimes playing with us. Years later, on the other side of the continent, one of my private pleasures is playing the Bach cello suites late at night with no one listening. And sometimes by the ocean with the moon glowing towards full, the old man whispers to me. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Very beautiful and beautiful even to hear though that music name, how I'd love to hear some of it right now too. Uh, let me thank you so much and to all the poets tonight who who took part in this uh, beautiful love letter to our, to our city by the bay. Thanks. Here comes Joyce to sign us off. Hi. Hi. That was wonderful. It was really a pleasure. Thanks to everyone who read tonight. Thanks to everyone who joined us. And I want to also thank our tech support, Rosalinda. And I want to remind you to look for this anthology, this wonderful anthology, Fog and Light. And you can please go to our online bookstore and uh, courtesy of our collaboration with Moe's Books, bookshop.org slash lists. L-I-S-T-S -S slash poetry hyphen flash hyphen readings. And it's also in the chat box. So check it out and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Joy.